You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday True Crime Edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts, and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. The long and short of Mr. Brooks' particular genre of fiction, and it is fiction, is that like Camelot, once there was a Republican Party, which for one brief shining moment was fucking awesome. This is from David Brooks, December 7th, 2017. Quote, the Republican Party I grew up with admired excellence. A lot of good honorable Republicans used to believe there was a safe middle ground. You didn't have to tie yourself hip to hip with Donald Trump. But you didn't have to go all the way to the other extreme and commit political suicide like the dissident Jeff Flake either. Yeah, big radical Jeff Flake. You could sort of float along in the middle and keep your head down until this whole Trump thing passed. Now it's clear that middle ground doesn't exist, unquote. And you can clearly see that he wanted to keep his head down until this whole Trump thing passed. Well, yeah. I mean, the existence of Trump belies everything David Brooks has ever said or written. Mm -hmm. And that's very inconvenient when that's literally all you do for a living. And in December of 2017, the same time, his revisionism was so flagrant that even the late Mark Shields, who was David Brooks's unfailingly affable partner on the PBS NewsHour since sometime in the late 1870s, (laughs) Shields had to slap him down. Uh, Brooks insisted that the previous two administrations had squandered their chances to address income inequality and instead, quote, the Obama administration decided to spend their entire administration talking about health insurance markets. And this is Mark Shields, quote, Uh, Not to be prickly, but I just point out that Barack Obama confronted the worst economic recession since the Great Depression. I mean, getting out of that was one was the prime concern. He brought us back from the precipice. I agree with you on the expanding inequality, but it wasn't comparable in any way to 105 sustained months of job growth and economic growth under Barack Obama that was inherited by Donald Trump and is about to be squandered in this giveaway. And when David Brooks didn't want to hear that and hand-waved it away and said, well, yeah, sure, they did that. But once they saved the world economy, they went back to fiddling with healthcare insurance instead of the real problems. Mark Shields once again showed a little rare fire. Mark Shields again, quote, you're right, but I just point out one thing, and that is saving the United States automobile industry Ohio and Michigan were not minor accomplishments, and they were opposed by the Republicans and the Republican standard bearer, you know, Donald Trump. As we mentioned in the last episode, having his face rubbed in the facts has never slowed Brooks down in the slightest. This time, he just packed up his false equivalences and marched them over to the New York Times, where he could lump Bush and Obama and Trump administrations together without having to worry about Mark Shields' troublesome facts getting in the way. I cannot emphasize this enough. David Brooks never learns, which is why being the world's greatest consulting Brooksologist, as I am, is usually a very tedious job. It's the same ridiculous bullshit over and over and over again that just fades into the background, like layers of sediment slowly choking off a river. (laughs) But every now and then, a comet streaks across the sky and suddenly everybody notices Something is drastically wrong with a system that keeps a blithering idiot like David Brooks employed and respectable. And this time the comet came in the form of Brooks, once again using his big imagination brain 
to imagine a conversation. He does this a lot. A lot. A lot. A lot. Imagining a conversation between an imaginary Democratic Party leader and an imaginary Democratic consultant. And the subject of their conversation is, of course, late-term abortion. His column from February 1st, 2018 was entitled The Abortion Memo. And it was blurbed on Twitter as follows, quote, how many progressive priorities are Democrats giving up just so they can have their way on abortion? Chicks, you know, chicks, they they don't understand. (laughs) On days like this, everybody notices how bad David Brooks is it and everybody weighs in. This is why David Brooks has a New York Times intern tweet for him. And he never, ever reads the comment section. (sighs) Now, as I have repeated many times on my blog, Mr. David Brooks is engaged in a long-term project to completely rewrite the history of American conservatism to flense it of all the conservative social and political and economic and foreign policy debacles that make Mr. Brooks wince and repackage the whole era as a fairy tale of noble Whigs being led through treacherous hippie country by the humble David Brooks. So imagine how much fun it was for me to see David Brooks in February of 2018 writing a column entitled How Nations Recover that was literally 70% love letter to the Whig Party served with the usual slice of both ciderisms. Quote, We have not passed a steady drumbeat of pragmatic reforms the way the Whigs and Tories did. Over the past 15 years, the United States had managed to pass just a few major pieces of social reform, Dodd-Frank, Obamacare, and I guess the Trump tax reform. Brooks, as always, fails to mention the passage of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act under President Obama and the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau under President Obama and the bailout of the American automotive industry under President Obama and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change under President Obama and the Iran nuclear deal also under Obama, who also, by the way, killed Osama bin Laden. Brooks also fails to mention that there would have been a boatload more Obama accomplishments were it not for the fact that David Brooks's Republican Party is a gang of nihilists and bigots and vandals and traitors who dedicated themselves single-mindedly to obstructing and sabotaging anything with Barack Obama's name on it. And that would fuck up his both sides do it scam. By mid-February 2018, Brooks was fully back in the both sides saddle. Brooks only ever has two possible solutions to the problem of the escalating madness on the right. Number one, insist that whatever is wrong on the right is just a freak of nature and that very soon there will come a great conservative renaissance. He never knows what Marjorie Taylor Greene is talking about. He doesn't listen to that. No. Uh, Or number two, damn both sides as irredeemably savage, and we need a third party full of David Brooks clones. Quote, eventually conservatives will realize if we want to preserve conservatism, we can't be in the same party as the Klan warriors. Liberals will realize if we want to preserve liberalism, we can't be in the same party as the Klan warriors. When this realization dawns, the realignment begins. Even with all the structural barriers, we could end up with a European-style multi-party system. Give me chills, Blue Gal. You're giving me chills. Unquote. Now, Driftglass, excuse me, but is he talking, when he talks about um, liberal Klan warriors as being exactly the same as Republican Klan warriors, is he saying that Marjorie Taylor Greene and Bernie Sanders are the same? Well, yeah. Bernie Sanders is the the great, at this point in his narrative, the great terrifying threat from the left who is going to turn our country into a Hugo Chavez style (laughs) dystopia. (laughs) Which is a okay. column he literally wrote, uh, <laughs> which I think has a lot to do with daddy issues. Yeah, I think okay. Bernie Sanders is about the same age as his father, and his father no. was a progressive, and I think there's some weird shit going on there. But yeah, 
He, but he just needs there to be two sides to every issue. So he just invents the left side and whoever happens to be in the barrel that day, that's who the bad guy is. Remember, we are barely a year into the Trump administration at this point, And Brooks has already walled himself up in the both sides do it fortress. And that's when Brooks's New York Times colleague, Paul Krugman, basically called for Brooks to be fired. No kidding. So it's important to read a couple paragraphs from Krugman now. Uh, his, his column was called Budgets, Bad Faith, and quote-unquote balance, in quotation marks. And Paul Krugman writes, Looking at all of this should make you very angry. It certainly infuriates me. But my anger isn't mostly directed at Republicans. It's directed at their enablers. Sounds like this guy's been reading Drift Glass. I'm just it, saying. Uh, hey. The professional centrists, both sides pundits, and news organizations that spent years refusing to acknowledge that the modern GOP is what it so clearly is. Why have Republicans become so overwhelmingly the party of bad faith? And not just about budgets, of course. Remember when Republicans care deeply about a president's sexual morality? The main answer is probably that the party's true agenda, dictated by the interests of a handful of super wealthy donors, would be very unpopular if the public understood it. So the party must consistently lie about its priorities and intentions. Washington is full of professional centrists whose public personas are built around a carefully cultivated image of standing above the partisan fray. I can name three people off the top of my head who are that person. Yeah. Um, Which means that they can't admit that while there are dishonest politicians everywhere, one party basically lies about everything. News organizations are intimidated by accusations of liberal bias, which means that they try desperately to show balance by blaming both parties equally for all problems, unquote. All of which should by now sound very familiar, except for the fact that it's coming from inside the New York Times house. Yeah, that was a big deal. That was a big deal. And after Krugman's broadside, Blue Gal, you know what happened? You know what happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. (laughs) Nothing at all. Nothing (laughs) changed. Nothing whatsoever changed. Just as Nothing changed after Brooks's imaginary abortion memo column or his scary Italian meats column or his tantrum over the factual reportage of Ronald Reagan pandering to racists to get elected in 1980 or his tantrum over Joe Lieberman losing the Democratic primary or his confident declarations about the GOP detoxifying itself and that it's definitely going to be Rubio or after the literally hundreds of lies he has told in the New York Times. Lies that are still being told by dozens of Brooks imitators all across the mainstream media and lies that are still being told by Brooks and his imitators all these years later. To understand how weird this all is, we have to introduce a new character into our story, Andrew Rosenthal. He was the editorial page editor of the New York Times and David Brooks's boss from January of 2007 until April of 2016. He is also the son of former New York Times executive editor A.M. Rosenthal. And believe it or not, as a boss, as David Brooks's boss, Andrew Rosenthal had rules. He had seven of them, and he printed them. In, did he print them in the New York Times, Drift Glass? Uh, he, I'm sure they were printed in the New York Times. He has a YouTube video. Oh, okay. And what his rules are. With it is saying these are the simple, basic rules of... Uh, how you need to write an editorial, the New York Times. Oh, how to write an editorial. All right. Yeah. And here they are. Number one, know your bottom line. Know what you want to say. Number two, be concise. Get to the point fast. Number three, give an opinion or a solution. Number four, do your research. <laughs> there is nothing that screws up an editorial faster than getting a fact wrong that you could have easily checked. Uh Number five, write clearly. Good writing is important. Hold your breath for this one. I'm just telling the audience, just make sure you're sitting down for this one. Number six, every writer needs an editor. After you've written your editorial, give it to someone you trust to read and listen to what they say. Are you sitting down, Drift Glass? 
I am Num- lying. Number seven, top. be prepared for a reaction. If someone writes you a letter, write them back. Be prepared to defend your position. Don't get defensive. <laughs> Unquote. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. What is truly unnerving, in case you didn't notice, is how casually Brooks breaks his employer's fundamental rules for writing editorials pretty much every time he puts his pen to paper, and perhaps more importantly, that he is allowed to break those rules Yeah, every time he puts Encouraged. his pen to paper. Through five bosses so far, yeah. and he just is, there's something going on that nobody talks about. And that's why we're doing this podcast, frankly. Um, and if you've listened so far, you will not be surprised at Brooks's reaction to the Stoneman Douglas High School mass shooting in February of 2018. Quote, if you want to stop mass shootings, it's not enough just to vent and march. It's necessary to let people from red America lead the way and to show respect to gun owners at all points. And as with his imaginary abortion column, Brooks was dragged all over the fucking internet for the next week or so. And again, Brooks continued to receive a paycheck from the New York Times. And that's when we started wondering if, in fact, David Brooks was Kaiser Sose, a guy protected from on high by the Prince of Darkness. Who the hell is protecting obvious frauds like Brooks? Who has the juice to protect them across multiple platforms. After all, Brooks is not just untouchable at the Times, but he's also untouchable on NPR, on PBS, at the Aspen Institute, on Meet the Press, and teaching a course in humility at Yale. So, quote Carmen Falcone from Batman Begins as he threatens Bruce Wayne with a gun in full view of two councilmen, a union official, a couple of off-duty cops, and a judge. He tells Wayne, now that's power you can't buy. That's the power of fear. The next title of Brooks's next column was, quote, The Virtue of Radical Honesty. Because, yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah. And the next column, the very next week, quote, The younger generations are more radical on the left and right. The rising political tendencies combine lavish spending from the left with racially charged immigration restrictions from the right. A week later, Martin Longman in the Washington Examiner, whom we know, ask the same question we all ask, quote, how David Brooks can look at our culture in the era of Donald Trump and blame liberal college students for the growth of tribalism, unquote. From Slate, a week after that, sweet Jesus, will the New York Times conservatives ever write about anything but the intolerant left ever again? And from David Brooks, a week later, Trump asked for the party's soul and he got it. That was the story of 2016 and 2017, The question of 2018 is whether the Democrats will follow suit. The temptation will be strong. In any conflict, the tendency is to become the mirror image of your opponent, and the Democrats are just as capable of tribalism as the Republicans. At this point, it was clear that the hot new word from this point on was going to be tribalism. Also, the word independent was making an entirely predictable comeback. After all, George Will... Jennifer Rubin and Joe Scarborough had, by 2018, all declared themselves to be newly minted independents. And just in case you think the term independent means anything, God-bothering pervert Franklin Graham quit the Republican Party and became an independent because the GOP in Congress passed a budget that Graham said was wasteful and provided funding for Planned Parenthood, which he compared to the Nazis. In January of 2019, Brooks had reported to his readers that despite having virtually unlimited media resources at their command, the collective efforts of the Never Trump Republicans had amounted to a whole lot of nothing. Quote, the decline of anti-Trumpism. The anti-Trump movement suffers from insularity. (laughs) He ought to know. Jesus Christ. Most of the people who detest Trump don't know anybody who works with him or supports him. And if they do have friends and family members who admire Trump, they've learned not to talk about this subject. So they get most of their information about Trumpism from others who also detest Trumpism, which is always a recipe 
for epistemic closure, unquote. May I I point out something right here? Yeah. The people he's talking about who support Trump are are called Republicans. (laughs) They're called the Republican Party, the base of the Republican Party, the leadership of the Republican Party. Anyone who calls himself a Republican when the pollsters call. Right. And 96% of them at this point support Donald Trump. And and what he's saying is the anti-Trump movement, which is made up of like 20 leaders, thought leaders, spokespeople for the Republican Party, he's saying very explicitly, they don't know what the hell their party thinks or believes. They don't know what the base thinks or believes, and they never fucking did. He's admitting right here, confessing right here, that the people who are most offended by the fact that Trump exists and commands such respect among the base never had the slightest idea what the hell they were talking about during all those years when David Brooks and everybody else was promising that the, the, the all this crazy talk from the left is just nonsense. None of that's going on here. This is a confession, and it's disguised as a critique, but what are you going to do? Brooks also thinks that these never-Trump Republicans are kind of dumb. Quote, I mentioned these inconvenient observations because the anti-Trump movement, of which I'm a proud member, seems to be getting dumber, unquote. And why wasn't the anti-Trump thing working? In April of 2019, Brooks reported back to his readers, quote, part of the problem is that anti-Trumpism has a tendency to be insufferably condescending. If I were Tom Nichols, I wouldn't take that. But Unquote, you know, that's, yeah. That's From me. David Brooks calling, <laughs> calling Tom Nichols condescending, really? In other words, Brooks is incapable of performing a glancing view in the mirror. No, that's not what you wrote here. Brooks is incapable of performing his function as a spinner of Beltway fairy tales without a fence to straddle and a high horse on which to stand and scold his lessers. Mm -hmm. And if no fence or horse is readily available, Brooks will fucking well invent one. Then a week later, and remember, we're still in the year of our Lord 2018. And for the umpteenth time, David Brooks peered over the lip of the hell mouth his party had created. And there, in the distance, can you see it? It's, uh, it's, it's, quote, a renaissance on the right. Oh, my goodness. And this is written by Mr. David Brooks. And who shall lead this imaginary conservative renaissance, which is definitely just around the corner? Well, it'll be a bunch of toddlers you've never heard of. And, quote, The National Review's Jonah Goldberg, who later this month comes out with his epic and debate-shifting book, The Suicide of the West. And against what mighty foe shall Jonah Goldberg be unleashing his portion of this burst of intellectual creativity on the right? You guessed it. Quote, Goldberg is right to fight tribalism on the left and on the right. A week after that, David Brooks penned a cautionary tale predicting the future of the American left as a Hugo Chavez dystopia. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I had to stop for a second. I was laughing. I was starting to laugh. Quote, on the right, tribalism brings us the ethnic authoritarianism of Donald Trump. On the left, it seems likely to bring us the economic authoritarianism of a North American version of Hugo Chavez. <sighs> By May of 2018... The Beltway establishment had reasserted its both siderist dogma with a speed and ferocity that, looking back at it now, was truly stunning. But after all, what else did they have? Careers and entire media corporations hung by this very slender thread. And so they dug in and defended their cult with a kind of single-minded zeal, which, if they had applied it to the GOP at any point over the past 30 years, might have spared all of us incalculable tragedy. Because, you see, the Beltway establishment can indeed rise to the occasion, as long as that occasion is protecting their jobs and reputations from the cruel judgment of history and the marketplace. Now, to any normal observer, the moment we were living through was the grotesque culmination of everything that had come before, going all the way back to Nixon and Strom Thurmond and the Southern Strategy. It was all of a piece, and we could all see it. But that story was heresy. Instead, Trump was a fluke. And prior to 2016, everything was A-OK with the GOP. And anyway, what about the extremes on the left, blue gal? (laughs) (laughs) And here's from David Brooks, quote, 
the Whig party is so lit right now. <laughs> which, which I cannot believe I have to read this. But yeah, he wrote that. And quote, the American Renaissance is already happening. The Whigs aren't dead. In fact, there's a revival and rebirth happening right now. By the summer, Brooks was on the woke is bad bandwagon. Quote, the problem with wokeness, unquote. By now, Brooks is so far out to sea that he felt the need to invent yet another ism to hang on to. He does this a lot. Every time there's a problem. An ism Mm -hmm. in which everyone agrees that every side of every issue is equally rich and valid and invalid and complex. (sighs) Quote, personalism, the philosophy we need. We talk in shorthand about Trump voters or social justice warriors because, you know, both sides. Both sides, baby. But when you actually meet people, they defy categories. Someone. <laughs> someone. Some imaginary someone person. Someone out there in the world. <laughs> as he writes, quote, someone might be a Latina lesbian who loves the NRA. Uh-huh. Or a socialist Mormon cowboy from Arizona. Yeah. Kinky Friedman and the Texas Jew Boys comes to mind. But- <laughs> Sure, whatever, David Brooks. Just make shit up. That's make, great. Make people up out of whole cloth. Back to David Brooks. Quote, personalists believe that, and again, who these people are, we have no idea. Okay? It's just something he made up. Personalists believe that people are, quote, open holes, W-H-O-L-E-S. They find their perfection in communion with other whole persons. Unquote. Oh, God. So forget labeling people and just hug it out, man. You know, people. People. You might find that the Latina lesbian actually loves the NRA, man. So hug it out. Yeah. This is when his new bride introduced him to Molly, I think. I think something. Yeah. He was on something at this point. However deep into his personalism naval David Brooks falls, in the end, everything is really the dirty hippie's fault. Quote, always, 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 quote, people like Stephen Miller are not steeped in conservative thinking and do not operate with a conservative disposition. They were formed by their rebellion against the stifling conformity they found at liberal universities. Oh, God. See, David Brooks and Stephen Miller could not get laid in college. I That is the problem. Absolutely true. Right? 100% true. 100%. Yep. Okay. Getting back to Brooks. Liberal universities, he said, their primary orientation is not to conservative governance, but to owning the libs. Dear Mr. Who is he talking about there? I don't. Conservative governance. Oh, conservative governance. So, so the people like Stephen Miller, their primary orientation is not to conservative governance, but to owning the libs. Okay. Stephen Miller. Apparently, Stephen Miller and eighty million other people all went to liberal universities and got (laughs) shit on by liberals. (laughs) And that's why I had no idea that 80 million Republicans all went to liberal universities, all <laughs> shit on by Republicans. That explains everything. That explains everything. <laughs> I didn't run into them when I was in college, but <laughs> I guess they were there. By mid-2018, Brooks was warning Democrats that, quote, by 2020, everybody will be exhausted by the climate of negativism and hostility, unquote. In October, Brooks was having his contractually obligated fit over the bad behavior on both sides of the Kegger Kavanaugh nomination. A week before my 58th birthday, Brooks devoted an entire column to impotent hectoring and finger wagging about how Democrats were not reining in the bile vomiting, hate mongering Republican hell beast to Mr. Brooks's specifications and satisfaction. Quote, Trump represents a comprehensive assault on the moral order. The Democrats fight back with paper clips. In November, just two days after Democrats came roaring back in the midterms, gaining 41 seats and regaining control of the House, David Brooks decided that in all this wide, bountiful nation, from the mountains to the prairies and that whole rest of that song, there was no one who could speak with more hard-won authority about the beating heart and secret dreams of the American working class than David fucking Brooks. Quote, what the working class is still trying to tell us and how we can make a difference in their lives. Unquote. Oh, my sweet and fluffy Lord. The whole thing reads exactly like the script for Preston Sturgis's 1941 film, 
Sullivan's Travels, if Sullivan's Travels had been written by a callow, privileged, out-of-touch goof instead of being a brutal satire of a callow, privileged, out-of-touch goof who wants to make Oh Brother Where Art Thou without knowing the first damn thing about suffering or hard work or human nature. You may remember that just the year before, Brooks had dismissed the Women's March as frivolous and indulgent and lectured the Democrats that if they wanted to win elections, they damn well better adopt Brooks's bold agenda of rebinding biblical capitalism in a functioning morality of balanced dynamism or whatever the fuck he was trying to say, instead of going with their scary vagina-based agenda of healthcare, clean water, clean air, decent schools, and not being a racist or a misogynist. And for a week after that midterm blue wave, America held its collective breath, wondering if David Brooks would finally admit that he had been spectacularly wrong about something he had manifestly been spectacularly wrong about. <laughs> and on Meet the Press, oh yes, on Meet the Press, America got its answer. David Brooks, quote, The question to me is, do Democrats have an agenda for the future? Running on pre-existing conditions, something that passed eight years ago, is not exactly a vision for the future. Do they have an affirmative vision for how a diverse country should work? How work should work? How moral integrity should be reintroduced? These are the big issues that are happening in countries around the world. Democrats have been running on a very small set of issues. Maybe excusable for the midterms, but not going forward because... So, so he doesn't talk about the fact that the Republicans had 60 votes to repeal Obamacare. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. It's That's that Democrats are obsessed with Obamacare, not Republicans. Right, right. And, and Mark Shields had to basically punch him in the throat yeah. and remind him of what we were all actually going through and how staunch and, and fanatical the opposition was from David Brooks's Republican Party. And yeah. he just won't bring it up. And since he can't be in a room with Mark Shields forever <laughs> or with Drift Class forever, he just can say whatever the hell he wants. He's on Chuck Todd's show. He can right. make shit up and no one's going to challenge him. That's the key part of this. Not just that David Brooks is a congenital liar, but that David Brooks makes sure he's never in a position where anybody pushes him back on anything. And so it sounds like he's speaking with a voice of authority, which he absolutely does not have. And the people who give him that authority are the Schulzberger family yeah, yeah. of the New York Times. And they do not pay David Brooks to be a journalist. They do not pay him to write in the style of planting one's feet and telling the truth. They pay him to dress up and pretend to be a journalist while spinning fables that reflect how a handful of wealthy, sclerotic plutocrats wish the world to be. And they want to sound those plutocrats. And by plutocrats, too, we just mean middle class white men also yeah. want to appear smart by agreeing with David Brooks. Oh, I just read David Brooks's column. It's just you know, it David changed Brooks my makes life. a lot of sense today. I don't know if you mm -hmm. read his column. Yeah. Yeah. And when it turns out that the world is manifestly not as Mr. Brooks has told them it was when the toxic racist sludge, the GOP has been running through the veins of the American body politic erupts in an electoral embolism so monstrous that it cannot be ignored. Brooks's feeble-minded acolytes turn to him not to tell the truth, never that, but to tell him, them bigger, better, comforting lies. Both sides do it, and the conservative renaissance is just around the corner. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that at this point in our story, the left has now all but disappeared. As far as Brooks is concerned, there exists only the center. That glorious, glorious center. Oh, oh. And it has been relocated to somewhere between the Trumpers, many of whom Mr. Brooks tells us are just terrific people. You know, the people, the, the personalism. And mm -hmm. the Never Trumpers. The Trumpers and the Never Trumpers, in between those two, and the Never Trumpers live terribly insulated lives. Again, oh, the fucking irony of that mm -hmm. statement. So now it's the end of November 2018 after the midterms and Drift Glass. It's time for more bullshit about campus speech codes. <laughs> yes. The, the number one burning issue in everyone's mind. Everyone's mm -hmm. mind, quote, liberal parents, radical children. The generation gap returns, mm -hmm. unquote. 
So given all that happened during the year of our Lord 2018, especially the majestic ass kicking that Democrats handed out to Republicans, what would be the most David Brooks way to round out the year? You guessed it, guys, from David Brooks, December 20th, 2018, quote, a new center being born. So how, one may reasonably ask, is it still possible for Brooks's center to continue wildly zigging and zagging like a terrified rabbit trying to avoid becoming lunch? Because kids, Brooks's center is magic. It's the philosopher's stone. Think about it. It is only through his unswerving allegiance to a wholly imaginary center that Mr. Brooks has managed to turn the dross of his shitty prose into New York Times paycheck gold. We know this because for the past 18 years, issuing dire warnings about the extremes on both sides and singing the praises of the imaginary center is literally the only column he has written. 2019, new year, new ism. Quote, you probably want to be a good person, but you may also be completely self-absorbed. So you may be thinking, is there no way I can be good if I'm also a narcissist? Isn't being good all about caring about other people? But how wrong you are. We live in a culture of self-ism, unquote. Pretty sure that's him trying to be funny, which always fails. So what have we learned? We have learned that Brooks is, in fact, made entirely of conservative shape memory polymer from 1988. <laughs> and that no matter how much stress and ideological deformation he is temporarily subjected to, he will always, always find a way to regurgitate one of his two basic columns. There's the personal and triumphal, in which he finds occasion to fondly misremember the glory days of his ridiculous, bankrupt ideology and confidently predict that a conservative renaissance is just over the horizon. And then there was David Brooks, the moon-faced alien anthropologist orbiting the Earth, noting the fall of American civilization to the extremes on both sides from the safe distance of wealth and privilege that this relentlessly mediocre man has somehow been afforded even as he surveys the cratered wasteland that he and his ridiculous bankrupt ideology have created. And since I promised my wife that this would be the last David Brooks episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff for now, we will lope through the balance of his years at the Times with the spirit of Monty Python's summarizing Proust contest in mind. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, Driftlass. I really do. <laughs> Brooks in his first column wrote about, 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 okay. Um, 2018 was the year that Brooks picked up yet another job. Dateline Washington, D.C., Aspen Institute president and CEO Dan Porterfield announced today that New York Times op-ed columnist and author David Brooks will lead a new Aspen Institute initiative to understand and reduce the growing fragmentation, alienation, and division around the country, unquote, from which he was forced to resign a couple of years later due to a conflict of interest. Brooks also sporadically gave up writing about politics and the media altogether, and busied himself writing long, cringy columns about faith and God and human nature, which are three subjects about which Brooks appears to know even less than politics and the media. But like the hardcore, both sides do it junkie that he is, however much he recast himself as the faith and humility reporter for the Acela Corridor Pantograph, he would always <laughs> find his way back to blaming both sides over and over again, and the Schulzberger family would always go right on paying him for it over and over again. From February of 2019, quote, an agenda for moderates. Just a few sentences. The left and right now offer two different magnetic ideas. The Trumpian right offers tribe, our kind of people, are under threat from their kind of people. We need to erect walls, build barriers, and fight. The left offers the idea of social justice. The left tells stories of oppression. The story of America is the story of class, racial, and gender oppression. A lot of us don't want to live in a war society, whether it's tribal war or class war. If the 2020 choice is between Donald Trump and a Democrat who supports the Green New Deal, I'd vote for any moderate alternative, unquote. Wow. He, yep. really, loves, he really loves his petrochemical stocks, doesn't he? Reading him over the years, it is astonishing how thoroughly evil this guy is. 
David Brooks went on to theorize that the reason moderates aren't dominating the political world is that they don't have, quote, magnetic ideas, unquote. And in an exact carbon copy rerun of the lies he was telling about both sides during the Obama administration, Brooks ticked off a few policy ideas which literally any Democrat would support and has supported. Mr. Brooks' column on, quote, Medicare for all the impossible dream, unquote, was a great big old pinata of wrongness, which everyone on the internet pummeled with their pummeling sticks until their arms got weary and they sweated through their shirts and blouses and used up a week's ration of the F word, after which Mr. Brooks was still employed by the New York Times and nothing whatsoever changed. In March, we got a bushel of ripe Nebraska corn entitled, quote, What Rural America Still Has to Teach Us, unquote. And everybody asked who this us was and why this man still has a job, and we never got an answer. This also was the year that Brooks published yet another book, which I believe is called The Second Mounting, and may or may not have something to do with how he achieved spiritual excellence, by jettisoning his first wife and marrying his much younger research assistant. I don't know. We haven't read it. We have no plans to read it. But it meant that Brooks was everywhere pimping his book. He was on Meet the Press, CBS Morning Show. He appeared on MSNBC to be interviewed by, guess who, Drift Glass, Andrea Mitchell, which Drift Glass had to watch through 10 inches of leaded glass. I, I did. It was, it was uh, pretty dangerous there. Uh Brooks showed up on Ezra Klein's podcast, where both of them chose to speak in a kind of prolonged, unbelievable double talk about nonspecific groups of people who join various tribes. Mm -hmm. You really blew it on that one, Ezra. In 2019, we got Brooks both sides in immigration reform. We got Brooks announcing, quote, the coming GOP apocalypse, stumbling blind into the age of diversity, unquote just three years after announcing, uh, quote, the post-Trump era, subheaded, as awful as Donald Trump is, it will be exciting to witness the coming recreation of the Republican Party. We are not making this up. No, no, that's the, that's the, that's the horrifying part. That's the We are not part. making this up. Not He's excited at- about the rebranding efforts of the Republican Party. Okay. And I, I assure you, having gone through hundreds of columns we are only hitting the top 2% of them. They're all <laughs> like this. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them just like this. So I'm sorry. Also, uh, we we get to be lectured by David Brooks again, Drift Glass, on moral formation. Quote, moral formation is not like learning math. <laughs> it's not cumulative. It's inverse. In a sin-drenched world... It's precisely through the sins and the ensuing repentance that moral formation happens. Here's a fun fact. Uh, David Brooks has never uh, confessed or repented to anything, ever. He lies about things he wrote. He lies about things he said. He pretends he didn't say what he said, but he's never repented. He's never confessed. And he certainly has never atoned for 25 years of this toxic crap. And there he is lecturing everyone else on moral formation and sin. So finally, we get Brooks dipping a toe into social media and throwing a white hot both siderous tantrum about the imaginary Internet fanatic that he made up. Yeah. Quote, and now a word from a fanatic inside the mind of an Internet extremist. And this is from the article. I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. I am an unattractive man. I believe my liver is diseased. I am one of those fanatics on the alt-right and the alt-left. The ones who make online forums so vicious. The ones who cancel and call out. The minority of online posters who fill the air with hate. Own the libs. Smash the racist right. A war of pure good and pure evil. Everything is race. Everything is class. Everything is moral rot caused by godlessness, unquote. It's just one long primal scream of middle-aged mediocrity who is terrified that he might be next on the professional chopping block. Then we get, quote, Trump is guilty, but impeachment is a mistake, unquote. But, you know, after that drift class, 
he's got to balance it out. And he writes, quote, the Bernie Sanders fallacy. No, Virginia, there is no class war, mm-hmm. unquote. So that brings us to February of 2020, in which we find David Brooks griping that, quote, instead of spending the past three years on Mueller impeachment, suppose Trump opponents have spent the time on an infrastructure bill or early childhood education. More good would have been done. Except, of course, Democrats did do both. During this period, the House under Nancy Pelosi passed nearly 400 bills. Trump and the Mitch McConnell Senate simply ignored them. And Brooks knows this, which means David Brooks is lying. Again, just plain lying. This is also when the pandemic hit the United States and states began issuing shutdown orders and schools closed and grocery stores were empty. And you you remember all this. It was in all the papers. David Brooks, who had been latched onto the wingnut welfare teat like a lamprey and had been nursing at its ample bosom since the 1980s, took this opportunity to warn Americans that, God damn it, quote, the age of coddling is over. <laughs> Learning what hardship has to teach us from David Brooks. We also got, quote, even in a pandemic, there are weavers and rippers. The weavers try to spiritually hold each other up so we can get through this together. The rippers from Donald Trump on down see everything through the prism of politics and still emphasize division. The rippers on the left and the right for whom politics is a war that gives life meaning, unquote. We got, quote, a quasi-religion is seeking to control America's cultural institutions. The acolytes of this quasi-religion, social justice, due to a simplifying ideology, the loudest theory of change is coming from the social justice movement. The movement emerged from elite, wait for it, universities. (laughs) We even get Brooks deploying the otter from Animal House defense. Gentlemen, I'm not going to stand here and let you insult the United States of America. Quote, our fixation on the awfulness of Donald Trump has distracted us from the larger problems and rendered us strangely passive in the face of them. Sure, this was a Republican failure, but it was also a collective failure. It's really everybody's fault, Drift Glass. Everybody's to blame. I'm certainly not to blame, Blue Gal, (laughs) says David Brooks. I had nothing to do with this shit. Everyone's to blame. And, quote, we still have a cultural elite that knows little about people in red states and daily sends the message that they are illegitimate. Uh, That's true for me. I know lots of people in red states. David Brooks doesn't know any of them, and they are, in fact, illegitimate. Wait, what is that I see? They're just beyond the horizon, just beyond that stand of trees. Is it? Could it be? Yes, it is a Republican renaissance. Oh, my God. Not a Republican renaissance, your class. Quote, where do Republicans go from here? The party looks brain dead at every spot Trump touches, but off in the corners, there's a lot of intellectual ferment going on, unquote. And then Biden won, and Warnock won, and John Ossoff won, and by the narrowest of margins, Democrats now ran the federal government. So Brooks rang in the new year with, and this is a quote, Driftglass, from David Brooks. In my New York Times column, I argue that Wednesday may have broken the fever, unquote. And yet we still got, quote, on the right, we have white supremacy, an effort. He, really, at that point, he just should have stopped the sentence. Right. right. But he can't. But he can't. On the right, we have white supremacy, an effort to perpetuate America's racial caste system and Christian nationalism, an effort to define America in a way that erases the pluralism that actually exists. I agree with everything he just wrote there. Mm -hmm. On the left, less viciously, we have elite, what? Universities that have become, okay, I'm done. I don't have to read the rest of that. You understand. No, yada, yada, yada. It's the same (laughs) shit. It's always the same shit. But elite Mm -hmm. universities are, you know, equal to Christian nationalism and white supremacy. Elite universities from which David Brooks graduated, yeah, at right. which he lectures, at which everyone he knows graduated, they're he, the real he problem. He lectures at Yale I just, on I humility. On humility. From July 2021, quote, how to destroy truth, unquote. Here's this column. Part of the blame goes to conservatives who try to whitewash history, 
part goes to progressives who tell such a negative version of history that it destroys patriotism. And again, I will not stand by here and let you insult the United States of America. Gentlemen. Gentlemen. Uh, He's talking about us, Blue Gal. You know that he's talking about us. And less than a month after the January 6th insurrection, I mean, come on, we get, quote, we are too close to the horrors of the Trump presidency and the trauma of January 6th. With some justification, Democrats have contempt for Republicans and don't want to work with them. The Democratic Party is not emotionally ready to enact the kind of government Biden promised. I think this is a mistake, but you can't argue with an emotion. We just got a window into the last marriage therapy session between <laughs> and his ex-wife. I think we did. Chicks, I think he they're was so cribbing. emotional. What he are you going to do, man? From that. You know, that's, a, that's also that's also as as he would do whitewashing any democratic mandate. Oh yeah. Just no. just paper it over because there's never a democratic mandate to do anything. You know. We we're, they're not emotionally ready. Yeah. to do any to have a mandate basically. Yeah. And while many normal humans were scrambling to find ways to cope with the multiple catastrophic problems inflicted upon them by a deranged Republican party, Brooks opted instead to squat on his toadstool and once again muse about an entirely imaginary problem which completely obsessed Beltway media conservatives. Quote, this is how wokeness ends, unquote. Yeah. We're not going to read you anything from that column. No. By the way. Uh, use your big liberal imaginations and you're going to get <laughs> to understand that he's writing it. about the end of wokeness. <laughs> wokeness. This is how wokeness ends. So this brings us to January of 2022, where David Brooks was joined by Charlie Sykes and A.B. Stoddard and Mona Charon and David French and Brett Stevens and David Gregory and Chuck Todd and Peggy Noonan and presumably the ghost of David Broder and the ghost of Robert Novak and the ghost of John McLaughlin in condemning President Joe Biden's voting rights speech, a speech in which Joe Biden told the plain, unvarnished truth and was rebuked as overcooked, bellicose, partisan, kamikaze madness that almost certainly doomed his presidency and the Democrats in the midterm. <laughs> and it immediately reminded you and I of how the entire Beltway establishment, led by David Brooks, then of the Weekly Standard, had come crashing down on the net roots for speaking the plain, unvarnished truth about George Bush lying us into the Iraq war and then hopelessly botching that war. So, having gone down this long road together, having sifted through more than 20 years of Brooks's columns and PBS appearances and hundreds of adjacent columns where one of his many imitators and fellow travelers just parroted his both sides mantra, what have we learned? We have learned that it isn't a road at all. It is not a journey, and it certainly isn't journalism. It's a circle that just goes around and around and always arrives right back where it started. A circle where the scenery never changes. It's just the same two or three talking points repackaged over and over and over again. It's the same banal 800-word, one-act play performed several times a week, every week, for decades, with minor changes to the props and the cast, but never the plot. A both-sides-do-it puppet show on which the entire mainstream political media, the corporations, their employees, and their advertisers all depend. And it is only in that sort of toxic environment where all the players are terrified of the truth and where the most highly prized skill is the ability to repeat the same comforting, anesthetizing lies endlessly. That sort of environment that both siderism's most fanatic evangelist, David Brooks of the New York Times, could have risen so far and prospered so lavishly. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this, uh, you know, true very crime blog- series. <laughs> yeah. Very long blog post that I, that I read aloud. Very, yeah. very long recap of 17 years of Drift Glass writing. Mm-hmm. Drift Glass, I want you to know how much I appreciate all the work you put into the scripts for these shows. It was just incredible. Well, labor, I, gotten- labor of hate. <laughs> I, well, I, it's not hate. It's it's. I'm, I really do think that we're doing the work that Josephus did 
yeah. during the sack of Jerusalem. I mean, yeah. these document people the gonna, atrocities. Document yes. the atrocities. Say what you can, but there's these people are in control of the media. Yep. And there's no doubt that they, by their actions, have shown they're never going to stop doing this. Yes. They're never going to stop. No matter what you and I say or do, no matter how often we prove them wrong, it doesn't matter to them. We yeah. literally don't matter to these people. And the best we can do uh, is put it all together in a story that anybody who wants to learn about it can learn about it. And I've had a lot of requests to do a novel or a book, which I'm, I'd am i have no interest in doing at the moment. But telling it week by week really kind of misses the flip book quality of it. Yeah. yeah. You know, when, when it's one or two or three or four or 10 graphic images, it's one thing. When you flip through hundreds of them and see, oh my God, this guy is just a monster. He mm -hmm. is an absolute monster. And he is doing it in public, just as it, he's just as public with his monstrosity as Trump is. He's mm -hmm. just as big a liar mm -hmm. as Trump is. Mm -hmm. He's just as big a fraud. And it's very profitable to him. To, and all of these people around him glory in him and praise him. And again, this isn't just about David Brooks. It seems to be. But it's all of his the, enablers. Yeah. It's, he's the avatar for an entire system that is built on this giant lie. And I am heartened. I know you and I are delighted when we hear <laughs> Keith Olbermann using our words and we yeah. see it all across many, many different platforms. People going, well, why is this both side shit still going on? And we just encourage you, A, to become Patreons, of course, right. and B, tell people about the fact that this one big lie is the, is the actual problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the best we can offer as far as a chop wood, carry water solution to the problem of the entire system being built on a lie. Because both sides don't. Both sides don't. So our plan, we're we're kind of on a schedule now. We're we're mm -hmm. kind of working on a schedule of having two episodes a week. We hope you're enjoying them. We are not going to commit to doing two episodes a week in December, but mm -hmm. we're going to keep doing these. And uh, if we have enough Patreon donors and we're getting close, we plan to do these every week on Tuesdays in addition to our regular Thursday show. Mm -hmm. So don't forget, we are looking for Patreon donors. Uh, to make this podcast really fly, we want mm -hmm. to we want to make it financially possible for us to do this uh, all the time. Oh, and one other thing I'd like to add. Yeah. If you're listening to this, you're an early adopter, or you're listening to this four years from now and laughing about how you know how we crashed and burned. So good for you. <laughs> um, but if you're listening to this like in the same time frame yeah. which it was recorded in in November December 2022. Yeah, and you have suggestions for stuff you would like us to haul out of the memory hole. Mm -hmm. And talk about. We've gotten a lot of suggestions so far from people just say, you know, you know what you should do. You need to talk about the the Iran Contra crisis. Uh huh. <laughs> and you know, Watergate's been done to death. Yep. But there are a lot of topics that would benefit greatly from a little sunshine and getting them out and and laying them out in, in public where you can talk about them and view them in a thirty minute or forty minute venue. Right. So if you have any suggestions like that, please pass them along. Yeah. And we're talking about doing Newt Gingrich. We're talking about doing Meet the Press. Mm -hmm. uh, Iran-Contra has come up. No labels. And no labels. Oh, yeah. No labels. A, the Tea Party. Part, yeah, the Tea Party. You know, Glenn Beck and the Tea Party is a is it a big one. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've got we've got a list, but we'd love to hear what you would like to see on the list because yeah. uh, you guys are smart and we appreciate you. So uh, please donate to us and to our work at patreon.com slash pro left pod. And thank you for that. And if you don't, I'm going to do four more of these with just about <laughs> David Brooks. Minor if works you, of David if Brooks. If you don't, there's going to be six more episodes on David Brooks. Yeah, just minor. <laughs> just paragraphs from his books read right aloud. <laughs> oh, yeah, we didn't listening. do enough on the books, see? No, no. <laughs> the All road right. to mediocrity, yeah. was that it? Yeah. yeah, it was. Um, The course of character, the... Well, the second didn't, mounting. Didn't the road to character have a quiz at the end? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it did. Yeah. Hey, see you next time. See you all next time. Thanks for listening. The Professional F Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.